I want to congratulate Ron and Nikki for having a, a, good, a good time together. We're all having a good time together. And uh, I think they both actually did very well. It was the first time in a long time he hadn't called Ron DeSantis a, a, a pejorative. They had a real problem too, I think, did the left with his success that they didn't really think was going to happen or didn't see coming. They thought he was so flawed and so many problems and indictments and impeachments. But he, he came out better for it. CNN could not handle how well he was doing. And that, to me, was the key. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a big night last night for Donald Trump, no matter who you are. You got to admit that he hit 50%. He won 98 of 99 counties in Iowa. And the one county that he's not winning, he's down by one vote. One vote and he would sweep everything. Uh, it's fascinating. Vivek dropped out of the race, endorsed Donald Trump. DeSantis squeaked out a second place finish. He keeps it a multi-person race. If you're a Trump supporter, that's what you want. Nikki Haley, despite finishing third, saying that she it's a two-person race. We'll get into that in a little bit. And the media, I took them to task last night, 30 minutes after it started. People hadn't even voted yet in most of Iowa, and they were calling the race. Well, what happened tonight is appalling. The media calling the race for Donald Trump before votes have been cast. I personally spoke uh, in multiple precincts in front of hundreds of voters. And while I'm presenting and delivering the closing argument to Ron for Ron DeSantis and actually flipping voters, people start getting alerts on their phone saying the race is over before they've even won. Why is that bad? Because if you're sitting there getting push notifications telling you it's over, why are you going to sit around for an hour or two? That's irresponsible, folks. It's not their job. No one's cast a vote or very few had cast a vote. To say that Donald Trump had won, is it's just irresponsible. And I was talking to people, and I know a lot of people in the DeSantis campaign found that, but if Trump had gotten under 50% and the media had made fun of him, knowing that a bunch of his supporters had sh not shown up or gone home, what would they be saying now? This was irresponsible by so many folks in the media. And, uh, and I agree that two great guests today, Hogan Gidley, uh, used to work in the Trump White House, but more importantly, he's won the Iowa caucuses twice with two different campaigns, Santorum and Huckabee. He's going to give us his analysis. And then Brent Buchanan, the uh, head of Signal, uh, it's a polling organization, brand new exclusive numbers today, including some on the border that are going to blow your mind. Let's get into it with Hogan. Hogan, thanks for joining us. I am excited to get your perspective. You've been part of two successful campaigns that have won the Iowa caucuses. So as somebody who looks at it from that perspective of what it's like to be a winner, what did you make of the results last night? What are your takeaways? I thought it was extremely impressive. Uh, what a victory Donald Trump had. You know, Mike Huckabee always used to tell me that there are two ways to run campaigns, unopposed and scared. Now, Donald Trump could never be accused of being scared of anything, but <laughs> I think they understood that they wanted to act as though they were the ones that were down 10, 20 points. And their turnout game was really big and really impressive. I mean, 1,600 precincts or so there in Iowa. He had more than 2,000 precinct captains, 400 training facilities for, for caucus captains as well, caucus goers, because I think three in 10 of his voters are new voters to the caucus. Yeah. So I thought him able to mobilize that was really impressive. In addition, you took a look at the rest of the field. I mean, DeSantis has been there for a long time, has been around the state, did the full Grassley, which is going to all 99 counties in a year like like the good senator from Iowa usually does. And they usually reward that. I mean, Santorum and, and our campaign, we, we went to all 99 counties. Huckabee went to all 99, and the voters rewarded him for that. I, I, they didn't reward DeSantis here. Um, they appreciated it, and I think a lot of people <laughs> did turn out, but it just didn't culminate in something that could overtake a former sitting president who is very popular within the GOP base. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I, I like that they appreciated it. They just didn't reward it. It's yeah. thank you very much. I enjoyed the meal. I'm just not going to tip you. Yeah. Um, so, all right, folks, I want to tell you about my friend Leo Grillo. If you've been watching the show for a while, you know about Leo and all the great work that he does at Delta Rescue. You can go to deltarescue.org, take a look at the videos, an amazing, amazing no kill sanctuary. Leo Grillo has made a life out of saving, protecting, nurturing, abandoned animals, dogs, cats, you name it. Delta Rescue is a mission of his. It's a passion of his. 
Um, if you're an animal lover like me, if you've rescued dogs, if you've rescued cats, um, then you're going to want to check out the amazing work of Delta Rescue. You go to deltarescue.org, there's videos, there's testimonials. You can see what I'm talking about. It is the world's largest no-kill sanctuary. It's not a shelter, it's a sanctuary. This is where animals can live in perpetuity. They can get the nutrition they need, the care they need, the support they need. And it's all because Leo Grillo made it his lifelong mission. And it's only supported through donations like me and you. Five, ten, a hundred dollars. But there's also a way that we can make this mission that Leo has created a lifelong one, an enduring one. And that's if we go to deltarescue.org and check out the estate kit that they put there. Download it, see if it works for you, if it could be part of your financial future planning. Go to deltarescue.org, hit that estate guide. Also think about a contribution. Help Leo Grillo and the great work that Delta Rescue does to take care of these abandoned animals. I think the thing that I've tried to break through in a lot of media interviews and discussions that I've had is that there's this fascination with like, well, like why didn't DeSantis? And the problem is I feel like they're all selling the same thing. They're saying, I'm going to give you Trump without Trump. And people are saying, yeah, but I can get Trump. Like why? Like it's literally like going and, and, you know, going to get dessert and then saying like, look, we can, we have this flavor that tastes just like vanilla. And it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's creamy. And then someone going, yeah, but can I just get the vanilla? It's right there. And they're saying, yeah, yeah, you can get the vanilla, but we've got another flavor that's just like it. And you're, it's, I just, I don't feel like for all these guys who keep saying how to take on Trump, the problem that they're missing is that people want Trump and they're not yeah. yet. That's, that to me is the, the fundamental issue that most of these folks in the media just can't get over. Well, you know, uh, to carry forward that analogy a little bit, you know, remember when Bill Maher said, you know, why, why would you want to go see the cover band, the tribute band, when the real one's right down the street? And I liken it to my analogy was, hey, it, it, the Rolling Stones are right down, you know, two blocks away. But but to my right, two blocks are the, ra the Rambling Rocks. Well, why would I pay to see them when Mick Jagger's right down there doing his show, right? right. Trump, it, Trump is the real authentic deal. And in fact, people in Iowa also polled, said they wanted someone who was going to be a fighter they knew could fight. And in this time of tumult, in this time of wars breaking out, in this time of weaponized government against citizens in this country, simply for having different political beliefs, are you willing to risk it with candidates who are promising to do the exact same thing Trump would do, but we're going to do it a little differently, but I promise I can do it, I promise I can, as opposed to Trump who says, I've done it. Guys, right. I've checked these boxes. You had energy dominance. You had low gas prices. You weren't paying as much for groceries and for rent and for car payments, right? You had a southern border that was sealed. 1.6 million people on the southern border in Trump's all four years in office. It was 3 million in one year under Joe Biden. People remember this. It wasn't you know, the Reagan years we have to point to for success. This is just a few years ago. So the jarring juxtaposition of where we were versus where we are now really gives Trump kind of the benefit of the doubt and allows his supporters to say, look, I like some of the other folks. I'm going to kick the tires. I'm going to test the waters to mix metaphors there. But then <laughs> I, I need to come back to where I know this guy's right. got a shot to win. I, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I it was just, I'll, I'll get to the media in a second, but let's just focus on Trump. I think that one of the things that you touched on was, you know, whether it's Santorum or Huckabee or Ted Cruz, they all really focused on on um, their turnout operation. And that was one yeah. of the big things that I was telling people going to Iowa. It's, a, it's different because you got to get people at seven o'clock. You got to get them to stay. Da, 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 da. Trump, from all of my uh, observations being out there, and having been there in 2016 was leap years ahead of where he was in 2016. They understood the difference. He's got a much more professional operation. DeSantis has that never back down $10 million, uh, tens of millions of dollars going in. And then Nikki Haley had the Americans for Prosperity Coke back group going in. The point that I'm trying to get at is that everybody actually had a solid ground game. I mean, these yeah. there was nobody there except for Vivek that really didn't have a strong ground game. Um, and, and I, I, I thought that that kind of, there was no, when you looked at it from an analysis standpoint, you had to say, these guys all came out of spring training strong. Yeah, they absolutely did. Um, 
you know, it's interesting because I think both Nikki and Ron are making claims now that are the only claims they can make. I don't think they're viable claims in that Nikki's saying it's a two-man race now. Right. So okay. so let's let, let me get to that in a second. I want to just start though, if we can go down, like as somebody who who handled the communications for winners and saw other campaigns try to make their case, let's do a, a quick analysis if we can. So let's start with Trump. What did you think of how he handled not handled, how did how he reacted to his win last night when he took the stage? It's really good. Uh, he talked about the other candidates in kind of nice terms. He didn't go after them per se, didn't throw any elbows. He thanked a lot of people when he went off script. He was very contrite. He was very appreciative. You know, sometimes he goes off script and that's not the direction he decides to go <laughs> in. And so I thought that was good. But he also talked about unification. And I think yeah. as Trump pulled out such a huge victory, going over 50 percent in this field with millions of dollars being spent against him and to suck up talent in Iowa. He is trying to portray himself as I'm the nominee now. OK, yes, I'm talking about Joe Biden. I don't even care about these other two. They're small potatoes. We have to focus on beating Joe Biden. Guys, we don't need to spend money fighting through the next several primary states. We need to get behind me so we can defeat Joe Biden. I'm going to bring everyone together. Republicans, Democrats said that from the stage. I thought it was a really good tone. He struck and talking about the death of his mother in law. He humanized himself quite a bit there, too. I thought it was a really good reaction from Trump yesterday. Yeah, I'm going to take it a step further. I thought it was a great reaction for all the reasons that you mentioned. He mentioned all the right people. He, it was the first time in a long time he hadn't called Ron DeSantis a, a, a pejorative. He literally yeah. just said, Ron and Nikki have run strong for second. Vivek came in. Well, I, I, I thought you're right. He thanked all the right people. I was watching because I was flipping around and I really desperately wanted to see how CNN reacted to it. They had to literally pull away. Yes. They were like, that's not a normal Trump speech. He's he's going to be hitting on his anti-immigrant. And it's like, no, it's not anti-immigrant. It's anti-illegal immigration. But CNN could not handle how well he was doing. And that, to me, was the key. That he was, he wasn't, it, it was literally the tone, to your point, the humanization, him being on his, the passing of his mother-in-law. Um, I, I was just like, boom, 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 boom. He killed it last night. And you're absolutely right. The, the call for unification after such a historic win, right? 50%. Yeah. And that to me was the magic number. He, that killed all the naysayers. He didn't have to, he had to beat 41% yeah. and a 12.8% margin, but he blew away everyone. Even Jake Tapper had to say nice things. Well, relatively <laughs> nice things. Relatively. Yeah. They get so mad. I mean, again, I used to think Trump derangement syndrome was something we would say to just kind of needle the left, just kind of the right. goofy Republican line. I think they're going to write medical journals about it one day. I really do think doctors <laughs> are going to see it. You know, it's the only, people, people the only medical Jake journals. Take notes and put it out in the New England Journal of Medicine and be like, hey, this is a real issue facing some Americans out there. Um, they had a real problem too, I think, did the left with his success that they didn't really think was going to happen or didn't see coming. They thought he was so flawed and so many problems and indictments and impeachments and all the attacks on him and his businesses, his family and his uh, uh, co-workers, his staff, et cetera. But he, he came out better for it. And yeah. I, I heard somebody, because I was at uh, several networks last night, and one of them said something like, you know, he's just seen, I hope he's okay. He seems so subdued. And I was like, well, first of all, I'm sure you're really concerned about his health. But second of all, <laughs> if he was out firebranding, they'd be like, this guy's too crazy. He's always, always too high energy and all this. Then he comes out and kind of gives a stagnant speech and they're like, oh, he's so low energy. What's wrong with him? It's just like he can't win with those folks. So it's a little frustrating. All right, guys, most of us know what it's like to be without power, sometimes for an hour, maybe a day, a couple days after a natural disaster, a hurricane, a windstorm, you know, whatever. But now national security experts are warning that our power grid is more vulnerable than ever. And they've identified nine key substations, which if attacked, they're saying we could lose power for months, months. That's why having your own solar power is more important than ever. So I recommend the Patriot Power Generator, which is a solar generator that you don't have to install in your house. It's portable. You can take it with you. You can use it inside your house. And it's powerful enough that if power goes out, we're talking your phones, your tablets, your computers, medical devices, even your refrigerator gets power. So if you go to fourpatriots.com and use code SPICER, you get 10% off your first purchase. It's fourpatriots.com 
includes that Patriot power generator. You'll get a uh, that guarantee for a year, free shipping if it's over 97 bucks, and a portion of every sale is donated to charities that support veterans, right? That's great. So go to fourpatriots.com, use code SPICER, fourpatriots.com. You do not want to be without power in case something happens. You know, since you brought this up and you were at a few different networks last night, I, I want to ask your opinion of that. I... I always get the sense when I talk to reporters who call me that they truly, you really understand how leftist they are because they can never put their finger on it. They go, how do these evangelicals support him? How do these young people support him? Yeah. Like they're, they're bewildered by the record. And, and you pointed this out a minute ago, cause I'll literally do what you did. And I'll say, what, what part the record of, uh, energy yeah. independence, a strong Southern border, low unemployment, no foreign wars. Like what, what part don't you get in there? But, but his tone, but the tweets, the way he goes after people and they can't fathom. And I think that has to really go to the heart of why they report the way they do that. They can't fathom anybody. They've never met anyone, uh, that, that, could possibly use the, you know, the pronouns don't jive with what they see. And, and that's what I think the biggest problem with the media is that they, they literally live in a world where somebody like that is an anathema to them. Well, a couple of things. You're hitting on something that's exactly right. It's an echo chamber. They are around people that believe like they do all the time and think like they do. So they don't understand anyone who has a differing opinion. Um, but at the same time, that's the policies they hold. They like the old establishment leftist policies. And so if a president pushes against that, remember, they called Mitt Romney uh, a segregationist. I mean, Joe Biden said he was going to put black people in change. Milk toast Mitt Romney. They characterize his rallies with, with Paul Ryan as reminiscent of the uh, Jim Crow South. They did the same thing to McCain. Now, when both of those people lost, now see, that's the good kind of Republican, Sean. It's McCain and Romney. Why yeah. can't we return to that? Right. Yes. So they don't like it. And here's the thing with Trump. And this is something that infuriated them because you were in the White House. I was in the White House. He didn't need the filter of Jake Tapper yeah. to get his message out. He didn't need the filter of George Stephanopoulos. He went to Twitter. Good, bad, or indifferent. You got to know what the president of the United States was thinking at any moment on any topic. Some of which you didn't care what he thought about that topic. But he let you know. <laughs> so that's one thing they resent about him, too. And I would dare say. What they're looking at is a potential second term for Donald Trump. And now, not only is he not holding anybody politically from a, from a monetary standpoint, from some big donor network that the establishment and the elites have to have, he also knows his way around the building in yeah. Washington, D.C. better than he ever did before. So now he has the intelligence. I don't mean that from a smart dumb. I mean, yeah, yeah. intel. Now he knows what goes on in that building. Now he sees how folks were working against him behind the scenes and three letter agencies and within his own administration and other cabinet positions to work against him. Now he's wiser for it. Now they are absolutely terrified that he's going to get in there and accomplish even more successes for the American people. Yeah, and there's truly no learning curve. But I just want to make one comment on what you said about the media, because this is where you're absolutely right. I tell people all the time that when, whether with the lobbyists or the media, they're used to, in a bipartisan way, having their butts kissed. They're having, like, I want the interview. I want to go to the White House Correspondence Center. And when Trump came in and said, I don't need any of you. If you want to get on board, get on board, but I don't need you. They couldn't imagine this world where they weren't getting sucked up to. And that's what they yes. resent about Trump. I always say, it's funny, you've ever talked to political consultants that don't like Trump on the Republican side. It's generally because they're, they got shunned from the Trump campaign yeah, or the we Trump. Didn't hire him. we didn't hire him. And therefore that, how could you possibly succeed without me? I am a great person. Right. And it's the same thing with the media, but I do want to turn, we've, we've done the analysis on Trump. So let's play this out for Nikki Haley. I want to play for folks a quick clip of her because she came out very clearly and said, this is now a two person race. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I can safely say tonight, Iowa made this Republican primary a two-person race. Tonight, tonight, I will be back in the great state of New Hampshire. And the question before Americans is now very clear. Do you want more of the same? 
or do you want a new generation of conservative leadership? All right, Hogan, let, just take this off for a second. Let's pretend um, that you are in South Carolina, you're advising Nikki Haley. Um, is that what you would have told her to say? Okay. Well, I'm from South Carolina. I know. That's why I years. asked. Nikki, Nikki was my governor. So let's be clear. I would not have told her to use that line about now it's a two-person race because she came in third. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Okay? And yeah. I saw her getting dragged on Twitter for saying that. But at the same time, here's what I get. What she's trying to say is, hey, look, I've got a, a poll number in, in New Hampshire, the next state that is within striking distance of Donald Trump. I really didn't even play in Iowa all that much, and I still almost beat uh, DeSantis. But now we're going to New Hampshire where I'm strong and my home state of South Carolina. She pointed that. Also, though, she's down anywhere from 8 to 20 points in New Hampshire and down 30 points in South Carolina. So pointing to those states didn't really make that much sense. But you see her logic. It's not necessarily strong. It's not a good case to make. But I see why she would say something like that. So what would, would you have her say? Well, I would just advise her to point out the fact that, hey, we really didn't play much here in Iowa until late because people got to see my message. They got to see me late and understand what I'm about and take it back to the country, you take down your, your, your list or whatever. But now we take the fight to another state, New Hampshire. We've got to grow this network and build the tent and do all kinds of euphemisms that Nick Haley, Nick Haley likes to do. But point to the future of how she is the one that is on the right trajectory to try and take down Trump one on one. Whereas Ron DeSantis, while he spent a bajillion dollars in Iowa, he couldn't get it done. Now it's time for me because I'm the only one within striking distance of Donald Trump. Everyone else is down by 10, 20, 30, 40 points. I'm within 10. I'm in single digits in New Hampshire. We have a, we have a week to get it done, and I know I can get it done, blah, blah, blah. That's what she should have done. Uh, yeah. And the thing that I agree with you because I would have oh, said- Oh, by the way, did you know she's a woman? I've heard that. She says that sometimes. I just want to make sure everyone knows. Wow. I I, uh, I actually agree with you 100% on that because I would have just said, you guys, I didn't even try and I almost beat a guy who spent tens of yes. millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm trying in New Hampshire, so get behind me there. I, I did think it was, I mean, it, it was, um, it's fascinating that the, if the media wasn't so on her side, there's yeah. no way that anyone else, because it's like, uh, it's a two person race, even though I got in third, so uh, true. which again, I was impressed by that. I, I thought, she overperformed um, what she was getting in the polls. She hasn't spent a ton of time there. Um, she's had a couple flubs with respect to Iowa's, you know, the talking points there. But yeah, I, I think it just, it, it, it was sort of cute, but I think she's also trying to get under Ron DeSantis' skin. Oh, sure. And, and really bum him out. And also send us, I think that was a signal to donors more than anything else, which is, hey guys, look at what I did without really trying. Imagine if you get behind me going into New Hampshire. Sure. And look at what Ron DeSantis didn't do. Now, Ron DeSantis says he's going to go on to, to South Carolina. Okay, great. But again, Trump's 1-0. and The field is 0-1. If he wins New Hampshire, these are all ifs, because no Republican has ever won Iowa and New Hampshire. That would be historic in its own right if he wins there. If Trump, it, it, look, a month from Iowa, excuse me, a month from New Hampshire to South Carolina, you know those calendars better than most. That's a long time. Yeah. These are all ifs. But if he wins South Carolina, you have a de facto, a de facto nominee by the end of February because oh, he will have been 4-0 and if you throw in Nevada, and the field will be 0-4. Right. Where in the world are they going to get donors to say, I think they've lost all these states, but I promise Super Tuesday, that's where it's going to be. There's no way. <laughs> right. By the way, I couldn't win a state that I could hang out in all the time, but I can go that multiple was the states. governor of. Right. Right. But so let me just, before we get to, to DeSantis, because I, I do want to get to DeSantis okay. and Vivek real quick. Um, if you're Nikki Haley, you're from South Carolina, you, Hogan, are from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So let me just play this out. Let's just say she gets her butt kicked uh, or a decent sh kicking in, in New Hampshire. Let's call it 15, 20 points. Nevada, it really is. It's weird to me why we're having a contest there that no one cares about, but that's a, let's leave that aside. It's Vegas, baby. If you can go into, if you go into South Carolina and you're Nikki Haley, to your point, you're losing by 30 points there right now, more than you are in New Hampshire. Do you want to, to officially be in the race still and suffer a huge defeat? Depends on what she wants to do in the future. Um, there what could would be you want to do that would not, 
I mean, I, I, I just think that there's not much that you'd say. F- I mean, even if you wanted to be a, like a, a lobbyist, you'd want to be like, Hey, I still have some poll in South Carolina getting your butt kicked. Doesn't even, even Kamala Harris got out before California in their primary. Right. <laughs> right. Didn't want to lose her home state either. You can't continue if you lose your home state. Ron DeSantis, of course, also down 30 to Trump in, in Florida. But you can't continue if you lose your home state. What's the case to make that the people that know you the best were your governor for right. eight years? But, but so wait, so let, let me just get back to the nut of this. As it, as it, you know, if, she, if you were playing the role of her advisor and she loses in South in, in New Hampshire by, let's just say, 15 points. Do you tell her to get out before South Carolina and say, hey, what do you have to lose? Yes, I would, depending on what she wants to do in the future. Now, I could see a world in which Nikki says, look, these are my people. I govern them for eight years. I respect them. I'm going to let them decide. And if they decide, I get it. And I'm going to st- I'm going to st- stand aside. And you're that kind of contrite. OK, maybe you say you want to lose. I would not advise her to do that. I would say if you're down by 30 points in South Carolina, you may want to decide to get out and say, listen, guys, it's time to coalesce. It's time to work together. We have to beat Biden. I've said that from the beginning. The man to do it right now, who has the, the trajectory, who has the votes, is Donald Trump. Now we have to put down and put aside our differences, and that's who we should support. Yeah. Um, real quick, so g- give me your take on Ron DeSantis and what he does, because, yes, he squeaked out a second. So they threw everything but the kitchen sink at us. They spent almost $50 million attacking us. No one's faced that much all the way just through Iowa. They, the media was against us. They were writing our obituary months ago. I actually, by the way, just real quick, I think that's a good thing for the Trump campaign. They want him to stay Huge. in the race going into New Hampshire, Huge. keep it a multi-candidate race, prevent it from being one-on-one. What do you tell Ron DeSantis that he says? Well, Ron DeSantis uh, is, is kind of a trickier situation uh, because, look, when we were with Santorum and we were with Huckabee in, in Iowa, putting everything we had there, we knew if we didn't win or, or finish like top two, it was over. But no one really cared because we didn't have any money. It was us and a truck and, you know, a few pizza ranches. That was it. Ron DeSantis spent tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to the Super PAC to try and win Iowa, and he didn't. That's a big problem. And with Ron, as we've been talking about, the map doesn't really work out for him because he's not winning New Hampshire. He will not win in Nevada. He will not win in South Carolina. He will be 0-4. And And I don't know what you tell a donor to say, hey, I'm going to stick in here, so keep funding me, because when Alaska and the U.S. Virgin Islands vote, I'm going to be right there. Like, I don't know what you tell them. So as far as DeSantis is concerned, look, I would never be presumptuous enough to tell someone when to get out, because I wouldn't tell them when to get in either, right? It's up to them. It's a personal decision, but he's got a tough road ahead, and I think think the campaign probably knows that, too. Yeah, they do. Uh, I think as long as they have money, they figure might as well spend it. And hey, are you a professional that's running a small business or maybe you know that person? Well, I've got an exciting, exciting new offer for you. It's called Ramp and it will maximize productivity and cut wasteful spending from your business. Ramp is the corporate card and spend management software designed to save you money and put money back in the pocket of your company. Ramp gives finance teams unprecedented control and insight into spending money. It can add restrictions, limits, all those things that you want. It's a physical credit card that you get to give employees that you don't have to worry about because you know where they can spend, how much they can spend. It's fantastic. Ramp saves you money. And here's the thing. Businesses that start with Ramp save on average 5% the first month. Who doesn't like that? It's easy to use. It's easy to get started. They issue virtual and physical credit cards, and you can start making payments in less than 15 minutes. Whether you have five employees or 5,000, Ramp is going to save you time and money. But here is the kicker. Whether you're that person or you know the person, if you go to ramp.com slash Spicer, you get 250 bucks just for signing up. 250 bucks in your pocket. That's why you are going to go to ramp.com slash Spicer right now and sign up. By the way, cards are issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members FDIC. Terms and conditions apply. I always remind people once in a while, to your point about these discussions that we're hypothetically having, right? These consultants, the second that their candidate drops out, the, the money train dries up. 
So they're yeah. making X percent off the ad buy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if they don't do another poll, the pollster doesn't get paid. I mean, there is an incentive for these consultants to say, come on, buddy, let's keep going. One more race, one more race. I, you know, I got a college payment to make. So that's what, you know, the, when you're in this race, you think you can win it. And if your consultants are egging you on saying, please keep going, we got money in the bank. Um, they, they'll, they might keep going because that, that's who they trust. Um, let, let me move on to Vivek. Uh, once he yeah, tweeted wait, out- Real quick, Sean. Yeah. Can I make this point too though? You know this. The media wrote a lot of bad stories about DeSantis' campaign. The Twitter stumble to start it off with, infighting within um, his own super PAC, problems gaining in the polls, et cetera, et cetera. So the cake was baked for that narrative. The frosting is now that they did exactly what they thought he would do, the stories are going to just rain down on him like a holy hellfire that will be like, see, this is all the problems. They were all well chronicled. No wonder he never got out of the blocks. He's a bad candidate. No one likes him, et cetera, et cetera. They've kind of prepared, built a foundation for that narrative. So now they're coming in and, and, and kind of trying to solidify something that the press themselves had kind of written about him and some of it justifiably, if that makes any sense. Yeah. All right. Speaking of cake, let's get down to Vivek. Because uh, that's how he likes, you know, get it? Yeah, um, I I, 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 maybe it's just because it was a late night, but I, I was kind of surprised that Vivek, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't, I mean, Vivek ended up with like eight, 9%, um, which is a little bit, it, he overperformed where he was supposed to, but not by as much as I kind of thought he might because of he'd made enough promises about these new people. Yeah. To your point about, you know, trying to go to the, he, he had done more events than anybody. The guy was a machine. Um, and there were decent crowds. They were young. I don't know what, what aspect weather might have played or whether people just liked hearing him. But he clearly didn't perform the way he, that he had presented himself. He said that he would sure. express, I mean, dead last is not overperforming. And I think he <laughs> had, uh, but, I mean, but he had kept saying, I asked him in, um, when we were down there for the debate in Alabama, and he said, I'm going to shock people. I'm going to surprise people. As of this moment, we are going to suspend this presidential campaign. And this is going to have to be, there is no path for me to be the next president absent things that we don't want to see happen in this country. I, I still, you know, I give him credit and Trump did at his speech. He said he went from zero up, but, you know, getting out, I thought it was smart when he did and he endorsed Trump. And, and the question is, was that the right time? And what is that going to mean for him? Well, interestingly enough, when you have the microphone, right, you've got opportunities. And you have to decide what those opportunities um, are. For example, Nikki bought some of that fool's gold, thought she was going to come in second Iowa and hung around. She should have left and been in New Hampshire. That speech should have been in New Hampshire, okay? Because if she'd have won Iowa, she said, this is a big surprise. We're already in New Hampshire, blah, blah, blah. If she got came in third, she could say, see, we didn't even try there. And we almost beat uh, the guy who spent hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm already in New Hampshire. We're going to take it, right? That was your moment. And they kind of whiffed on it, in addition to saying she was part of a two-man race when she was third. Vivek had the opportunity here when the world was watching. What were his supporters going to do? Okay, Chris Christie had that same opportunity, too. And he just said, I'm getting out. And then on a hot mic, which, again, you know him very well. He's very savvy with the media and microphones. I'm not entirely convinced that wasn't on purpose, but okay. So a lot of Christie supporters have the same gut reaction, visceral reaction toward Nikki. They don't like her. But they came out and said, I'm going to put all this to rest right now. I've got the microphone. You're listening to me. Other, people's, other people have given speeches tonight. Here's what I'm going to do with my time. Two America First candidates, me and Trump. I'm getting out. I'm throwing support behind him. I thought, if you're going to do it, do it when you have the pulpit. Yep. Don't wait till tomorrow. I thought that was right. This race is moving too fast. We're too close to New Hampshire. And if you want to use them in New Hampshire, which they're going to do, why not start now? I agree. Well, let me just ask you one last question because we're running out of time. If you were on a lot of networks. You were on NBC last night. Um, you've watched a lot. How would you grade the media's coverage of, of Iowa in general and Trump's win? Uh, writ large, I mean, um, I, I don't know, maybe a C. At yeah. best, I think there's been some good analysis out there. They delve into numbers and all that. But again, even reporters I saw last night on all the networks talking about the importance of 
Donald Trump's record, they said things like his his um, unproven data on the border. What? They said things like, <laughs> yeah, voters, that's- voters really like Trump because the Supreme Court banned abortion. Did they? Because I read that ruling. I don't yeah, remember I- the Supreme Court banning abortion. Like they just wrapped their spin their own narrative. Do you know what my takeaway is, Hogan? They're stupid and biased. That's it. I mean, they're biased, <laughs> A, but they're also just dumb. I mean, honestly, I hate to say, like, just so people get it, most of these folks just don't, they, they parachute in to Des Moines after swinging by the Patagonia in Georgetown in Washington uh, to buy some boots and a new hat. And then they swing into Des Moines, <laughs> they go to the thing and they act like they know what's on the minds of, of, of um, Iowa voters after getting a double latte chai tea uh, at Starbucks in the Marriott there in Des Moines. Um, yeah. Anyway, Hogan, I, I do appreciate you're you so, are so insightful on this stuff. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing your your time with us. Absolutely, Sean. Thanks so much. All right. All right. I want to thank Hogan for that. Now let's bring in Brent Buchanan with these exclusive numbers, especially about the border. Brent, uh, good to see you. Before we get into the to the the data that you just got out of the field with in this brand new national poll. Tell me as a pollster, someone who watches this race, what were your key takeaways from what happened in Iowa last night? Well, it was really fascinating to see such a low turnout. I knew that the weather would have some sort of impact uh, on turnout, but to have fewer than 120,000 people after almost 190,000 participated in the 2016 election just shows you that this race is not viewed as very competitive. Um, Even despite the weather, I think that that number is incredibly low. Um, You know, one of the things that we had mentioned uh, just kind of going into the caucuses is that it was likely that that Haley uh, underperformed her expectations and that DeSantis would overperform his expectations. And that's just because DeSantis has or had a better organization on the ground. Um, That's how he was able to pull out several points higher than the uh, real clear politics average had showed. And Haley just kind of hit the mark. Uh, So. I guess that was probably the biggest surprise is, is the lack of turnout, which to me shows enthusiasm for Donald Trump because people just think he's got it in the bag. All right. There's key issues I want to get into in your new poll uh, on the border in particular. But before I do that, just go over with me and our audience the sort of the top line. Where's the country? Where's the national race? And I get it. I am not a huge fan, not even a fan of national stats, but they do show momentum and movement. So where do you see the national mood of the country right now? Yeah, there was uh, a bit of some Christmas spirit uh, in how people <laughs> felt about the direction of the country in, in November and really December. And it's interesting because we saw the exact same trend 12 months ago occur. Uh, but what happened going into January is that there was really a uh, snapback into this dour mood of what direction our country is headed. Uh, and so it's some of the worst numbers we've seen in, in months of right direction versus wrong track. Uh, and, and even Biden's image has slipped a lot uh, in the past month or, or several months. And so that's really leading to a place where Republicans are starting to pick up, as you mentioned, this momentum, this trend um, in their favor. Uh, we're down by the least amount with female voters on a generic Republican ballot that I've seen uh, in probably the last year. Uh, we've closed the gap with college educated voters. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's, it's not as much about Trump as it is about Biden. Uh, and this is something that makes 2024 very different than 2020 is that Biden is no longer uh, this kind of bland vanilla ice cream guy hiding in a basement against a very defined Trump where people have incredibly strong opinions one way or the other of him. And uh, you're starting to see that his uh, Biden's uh, you know failure as president is starting to bear out in places like, as you mentioned, uh, immigration is really just surging, uh, almost as almost like these folks surging across the border. One of the things that you guys looked at is both the Biden age effect and the effect of uh, RFK on the race. Walk us through both of those. Yeah, I was a bit surprised um, because if you ask a question uh, in a survey of, you know, are you concerned about Joe Biden's age? The number is going to be astronomical. If you ask uh, you know, are you worried about Trump's age? The number is going to be astronomical, but those are really logical responses to surveys. And so what's more important is to, to say, okay, now think about Biden's age and then ask them the ballot. Are you going to vote for Biden, Trump, or are you undecided? And in that context, which is how we framed it in the survey for you and your, your viewers, uh, 
it did not change the race at all, which was really fascinating to me. I mean, there was a point So is that, that means it's baked in? Subgroup. Yeah, I think it's baked in. I mean, if people are, are taking the race at face value of like, all right, you know, whether I like it or not, this is Trump versus Biden. And now I've got to make the decision on other factors beyond, you know, I wish it was a different candidate or I wish he were younger. So it's almost like uh, when people, uh, you know, to throw out a new thing about Trump, something that he said, it's like, no kidding. Like, you know, I've heard everything in the last seven years about Donald Trump. It's already baked in. They either like him or they don't. But the latest outrage the media has isn't going to affect. So it's the same thing to some degree, I guess, with Biden's age, which is, you know, the guy's 81. He's got issues, you know, declining mental and physical uh, issues. So you, you kind of already know that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. That that's not new information to somebody, right? Where they're like, "Wow, I guess I, he is kind of old. Maybe I should take that into consideration." <laughs> well, it, that's why he can't walk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what about RFK? You guys looked at that uh, and the effect that he may or may not have. And again, I caveat this for people: Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is on one ballot on Utah right now, and so he can poll what he will as can any third party, but until they get on a ballot, it's almost a moot point. But talk to us about what you guys found. Yeah, we, we've been tracking a three-way race for a while now um, between Biden, Trump, and, and Kennedy. And uh, you know, for those of you who are not uh, connoisseurs of Oregon state politics, I would recommend you go back and look at the governor's race in 2022, uh, where there was an incredibly well-funded, well-liked uh, candidate in Betsy Johnson. I think I'm getting her first name right. And she polled in the 20s, even the low 30s, uh, kind of this point out from the election. And as it got closer and closer to the election, she fell apart. And I believe she ended up somewhere under double digits in her final vote share, uh, because at the end of the day, we're still a binary political system of Republicans versus Democrats. So, you know, at this point, any response of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on a survey is really a protest. It's not right. support for the guy. It's opposition to the other two guys. Uh, so I don't pay too much attention to that ballot because I think at the end of the day, somebody's more likely uh, in November 2024 to skip the presidential race and keep voting past it or just not show up at all than they are to protest with a guy who they know has absolutely no shot of, of winning even a single state or coming into probably 15 or 20 percent in any given state. So um, what's interesting is there is a subset of voters that are younger and slightly more conservative that are currently driving this kind of protest vote. Huh. And uh, and so it's that group that Trump's going to have to really focus on uh, as this election progresses. Interesting. Uh, what really popped out when I read the results of this new signal national survey was the border. The first yeah. thing I want you to address, two thirds of respondents said that they support deporting people in the country illegally. Wow. I walk me through where that goes down. How like is it in terms of how how is it party driven? Is it ideologically driven? Yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you had us put this question on here because, uh, you know, we asked another question, which is, do you think Republicans should shut down the yeah. government in order to shut down the border? And that one actually came back with don't shut down the government. Uh, which was a, a bit surprising. And, th yeah. and then when we frame it in this way of deportations, we even get 50% of Democrats who agree with deporting wow. illegal immigrants who have come to America illegally, which was the most surprising number to me. Uh, and it's only Democrats that drive the opposition, which is only 26% of, of people oppose this, yeah. which is basically 40% of Democrats driving all of that. And so you've got you know, 80% of Republicans, 70% of independents who are saying deport illegal immigrants. And, uh, you know, anytime you're looking at a survey and you're trying to figure out what's going to happen, look at what the independents are doing on the key questions. And I consider this a key question because, uh, you know, we've now got illegal immigration at 20% and inflation and economy at 30%. And so this has right. really skyrocketed as an issue. And I've seen this happen in all of the 60 something surveys we've done so far this month where this issue has really risen to the top in Republican primaries and general election surveys. And these independents are looking a heck of a lot more like Republicans. And if you think back to 2016, you know, Donald Trump ran on build the wall. This is not right. the first time that illegal immigration is an issue. And I guarantee there's a heck of a lot more heck of a lot more folks streaming across the border now than there was in 2016 when Donald Trump was saying, 
uh, that we need to build the wall. And so these 70 percent of independents saying deport illegal immigrants, that's a really big problem. Well, for well, I, I've got 30 seconds left, Brent. And, and I think the other number that popped out at me, 64 percent support militarizing the southern border. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, almost no change among Democrats here. The only difference between deport them and militarize the border is that there's a little bit of a shift among independents. About 8% of independents shave off of support into oppose, but it's still two thirds of independents right. that support militarizing the border. So I think this really shows that Americans are sick of what we're doing now. Yeah. And it's not close the border, but it's definitely do whatever is necessary to stem this tide. And I I thank Governor Abbott for that, shipping folks all over the place and making them realize this is not a (laughs) Texas, Arizona problem anymore. All right. Where where can people see these results once they now that they've they've gotten the taste? Yeah. So this is first for you, uh, but your viewers can go to C-Y-G-N dot A-L. So that's our company name signal with just a dot before the A-L. Okay. Uh, Thanks for sharing that with us, especially exclusively. Again, folks. This is the kind of place where you're going to see statistics, information, and analysis that you won't see anywhere else. Thanks for joining us today. We got a lot more coming. Don Jr. is expected to join us later in the week. Uh, Continue to subscribe, share, rate. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.